Hello, my name is Lisa Foran. My paper today is titled Untranslatability in the Ethics of Pause. Before I start, I'd just like to thank our hosts, uh, Alice and Philip, for organising this event. I really look forward to listening to some of the other presentations over the coming weeks and to hopefully engaging with many of you in September. So let's start with the aim of my paper today. So what I want to uh, argue today is that untranslatability is the condition of translation. It's what has to be there for translation in an ordinary sense to happen at all. But also that untranslatability offers us both a normative and a descriptive model for ethical intersubjective relations. So untranslatability is not just something that refers to a textual practice, but also refers to ways in which we relate to each other uh, as human beings. So how am I uh, going to get to that conclusion? How am I going to prove my argument? Well, my paper today has four steps. Um, the first part of the paper, which will be the longest part, tackles uh, a common conception of untranslatability as something that is problematic, that ultimately reflects a failure to understand what translation really is. My two examples of this version of untranslatability are Paul Ricoeur and uh, Lawrence Venuti. And here, the claim from both of these thinkers in different ways, the claim is that if you com are committed to the untranslatable or the idea of untranslatability, then you're missing the point. That uh, a commitment to untranslatability reveals a commitment to a reductive view of translation as something that merely transfers an ideal, abstract or invariant meaning, kind of platonic model of language, from one language to another. So both Ricoeur and Venuti argue this is a wrong way to think of translation. So I'll run through their arguments and point out something I think they're missing. And this will be the, the longest part, as I say, of the paper. The next uh, approach to untranslatable is uh, something we get most explicitly in the work of Martin Heidegger, but something that has a history across various thinkers, from Sapir and Worf to Fichte to Herder. And this is the idea that untranslatability is a fact of language. And here what we get is a kind of sacralization of the untranslatable and something that uh, Barbara Kassan refers to as ontological nationalism. Here the idea is that the untranslatable is, is true. It's something worth being committed to. But uh, it is something that occurs only in very specific languages. And of course, there are obvious ethical, social and political problems with this approach to the untranslatable. So I'll briefly outline that and show what those problems are. Then in step three of the argument, I uh, turn to Barbara Kassan and I look at her account of the untranslatable as what we keep on not translating. And what I want to say is that while there is a lot we want to take from Kassan and we want to hold on to, I think this definition of the untranslatable as only that which we keep on translating or keep on not translating, only as that which um, provokes a kind of hermeneutic response to a text, almost doesn't go far enough. So in the last part of the paper, I want to bring um, two ideas from Derrida and Levinas into the conversation and to argue that the untranslatable is in fact a kind of pause. It is an ethical pause. It is a breath. It is an interruption in our process of understanding. And that process of understanding can be an understanding of a text or an understanding of another person. And when we think of the untranslatable as something that interrupts that understanding or as something that causes us to pause from just merely absorbing a text or merely absorbing or using another person, 
then the untranslatable offers us a way to think of an ethical moment that disrupts our usual handling of the world. Okay, so let's start with step one, uh, this account of the untranslatable as a failure to understand what translation really is. Okay, so our first example of this account of the untranslatable is something we should just give up on and, and walk away from and stop using when we talk about translation comes from Paul Ricoeur. Paul Ricoeur obviously has extensive commentary on translation, not just in those later, uh, the, those later essays published now as on translation, but even elsewhere in his commentary on uh, Europe, in his commentary on justice, translation often crops up for Ricoeur. And uh, when he talks about translation, Ricoeur says, look, we need to move away from the untranslatable, translatable dichotomy. And we need to move towards rather a faithfulness or betrayal model. And there are really good reasons why he argues this, right? He says, if we go with the faithfulness betrayal model, we'll end up with something that's a little more ethical. And um, the untranslatable, he says, commits us to one of two uh, ruinous alternatives. Either, if you're into the untranslatable or you're committed to the untranslatable, either you think, well, translation is impossible because language reflects different worldviews, right? Um, and he says, so you think everything is untranslatable because every language carves up the world so differently that you can't have communication. And he makes this kind of wry comment where he says, well, in that case, translators must be schizophrenic. And he draws a lot here on Donald Davidson's idea of conceptual schemes or arguments against conceptual schemes. And this wonderful line from Davidson, he says, translation is theoretically difficult, but practically easy. Right. So when we think about translation, we think, God, how does that happen? But actually, when we do it, we find we do it relatively easily. So Ricoeur says, if you're committed to the untranslatable, you think there's no communication between language, that's clearly a ludicrous position. The other option, if you're committed to the untranslatable, is to think that translation is made possible or happens because of a common fund. And, and this second strand goes down two reasons. Either you think there was an original sort of pre-lapsarian language, or there is some kind of a priori system of code. And he says this is problematic. Right? So if you're committed to the original language model, you're committed to some sort of um, ideal language from the Garden of Eden. right? And this is really problematic because what you're saying there, and this is uh, something we find sometimes in interpretations of the myth of Babel, what you're committed to there is that, oh, once everything was perfect, we all spoke the same language and everybody understood each other. And then some catastrophe occurred, which led to us all speaking different languages. And this is really sad. Now, this is problematic because obviously it's not true, but more seriously in terms of our concerns in this paper, more seriously, it commits you to this idea of, well, what we need to do is go back to this perfect time when everybody was the same. And Ricoeur says, we don't want to do that. We know where that leads, right? We've, we've seen the National Socialist movement of trying to get back to some pure Aryan language or some pure Aryan race. Anything that commits us to a return to some ideal invariably leads us into politically and ethically dubious zones. So we don't want that. Equally, the a priori code system has been proven to not work, right? From Bacon's lexicon of universal ideas right the way up to the sort of failed dream of Esperanto. So this idea that languages have a common fund doesn't work, right? So Ricoeur says, listen, let's just move away from this idea of uh, the untranslatable altogether and think about translation as this balancing act where he, he draws in that Schleiermacher term of bringing the author to the reader, the reader to the author. The translator here is a host between these two people, 
And what we need to do when we think about translation is to think of translation as work, as a labor, arbeit, as this work of mourning, work of forgetting, this working through of something. And here what we're doing, what we're mourning in that Freudian sense is the ideal translation, right? If we free ourselves in this sense of overcoming uh, that Freud refers to, if we free ourselves from the ideal of a perfect translation and accept the fact that every translation is a kind of intermediary of possibles, right? It could be this, it could be that. No translation is going to get every little thing. That's okay. We can all move on and see translation instead of this failure of untranslatability, we start to see it as this happy act of hospitality, bringing people together. Now, this sounds really positive and there's a lot we want to hold on to here from Ricard. But one of the dangers, I think, is that it makes everything sound very comfortable. And I think that when we get everything sounding very comfortable, we can relieve ourselves of some of our moral burdens. Um, I think it's important to realize that our relations between different languages and also between each other can be difficult and hard. We don't want to ease ourselves into this kind of comfortable, well, that's the best I can do sort of attitude. Equally, Ricker holds on to quite moralistic language, this idea of being faithful or betraying, I think is very problematic. And we know that in translation studies, there is a long history of engagement with those terms and how complicated and, and strange they make the act of translation, not least from feminist perspectives. And finally, the problem with Ricoeur's account is that it's still actually, despite claims to the contrary, it's still actually committed to translation as a failure because the idea is that, well, you have to betray in some sense and you have to be faithful in another sense. But once you set translation up as, in any sense, a betrayal, then I think we've, we've gone too far. So while there's a lot from Ricoeur I think we want to hold on to, I also think it, it doesn't go far enough. So let's look at the next example of this idea that the untranslatable is a failure to understand what translation really is. Okay, so we'll take a look at our second example of criticisms of the untranslatable. And this comes from Lawrence Venuti. He sees commitment to the untranslatable as a commitment to what he terms the instrumental model. So for Veneti, models of translation act in ways that are akin to Foucauldian epistemes, or we might also add something like a Kuhnian uh, paradigm, where certain ways of practicing are available and also other ways of pr practicing are precluded. The instrumental model of translation, wherein we get accounts of the untranslatable and what Venuti calls these really big problems, presumes an invariant in the source text. That invariant can be semantic, so a sort of traditional platonic idea of meaning as an abstract ideal that can be dressed in different ways depending on the language one uses. But Venuti goes on to say uh, the presumption of an invariant can be uh, stylistic, it can be the response of the reader, ultimately it's anything where the translator operates with the aim of trying to recreate something of the source text in the target text. Right? He, he says this is all part of an instrumental model. He contrasts this with a hermeneutic model where translation is viewed as an interpretative and transformative act, it's very akin to Ricoeur and other hermeneutic phenomenologists. Here, the understanding is that translations are not the same as the source text, but rather the hermeneutic model considers translation as an interpretative act that varies the source text according to intelligibilities and interests in the receiving culture, what he calls elsewhere interpretance. 
So the idea is that rather than trying to take something from the source text and drag it across into the target text, with the hermeneutic model, the translator sets up a kind of relationship between the two texts where they're sort of talking to each other and the translator says, look, here are the things I'm going to be conscious of creating in the target language. And they can be various different things and these are the interpretants. In this vein, uh, Venuti is highly critical of people like Emily Apter and Barbara Kassan. He accuses them of following an instrumental model uh, because of their emphasis on the untranslatable. He says they are committed to an invariant in the source text. Their work is Eurocentric. They are committed to translation as a failure and they are politically naive. Now, these accusations, I think, are a little extreme and uh, largely unfounded, but they come from Venuti's concern with overcoming the untranslatable in translation studies commentary. Venuti goes on to talk about how our proverbs of untranslatability reveal our commitment to translation as reproduction of invariants. And these proverbs are things like traduttore traduttore, poetry is what is lost in translation, Derrida's nothing is translatable, everything is untranslatable. So these uh, kinds of phrases, Venuti says, reveal the fact that we all think translation is always a failure. Now, my problem, and, and we can talk a lot about this in, in the discussion, hopefully in September, my problem with Venuti is twofold. Firstly, he ends up being committed to the view that everybody who's translating and everybody who's talking about translation uh, is part of the instrumental model. Um, but also that I think it's a misrepresentation of the untranslatable. I don't think that the untranslatable means a commitment to an invariant. I think rather recognizing untranslatability is about recognizing the importance of particularity within universality. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk about when we get to Kassan. But before then, I want to just briefly mention uh, Heidegger's account of the untranslatable. So we've been looking at accounts of the untranslatable is something we need to give up from Ricker and Venuti. Now I want to look at something that says the untranslatable is something we should hold on to and point out some problems with that version of the untranslatable. OK, so if Ricker and Venuti think that we should give up on the idea of the untranslatable. There are many thinkers who think that we should hold on to it, perhaps the most notable of whom is Martin Heidegger. These thinkers tend to feel that there are certain traits of particular languages that cannot be recreated in other languages. This leads to what Barbara Kassan calls an ontological nationalism. Martin Heidegger, but we can talk about other thinkers in, in different ways, Sapir and Worf, but also Fichte, Herder, um, view the untranslatable as sacred and exclusive. So Heidegger in a lecture course from the 1930s in Freiburg says, the same applies to every genuine language in a different degree, to be sure. The extent to which this so depends is on the depth and power of the people and race who speak the language and exist within it. Only the German language has a depth and a creative philosophical character to compare with the Greek. Now, this is, of course, a kind of culmination of a German exceptionalism that began with the works of people like Herder and Goethe, who saw translation as something that the German language was particularly capable of, that it had this capacity, as Herder says, to bend to foreign influences. So translation became, at a certain point, the characteristic of the German language. Now, this went on to be taken up in ways that were obviously politically dubious by people like Fichte and ultimately Heidegger. Now, um, here is, there is the problem that, first of all, the untranslatable is not really taken as untranslatable at all, because what people like Heidegger are saying is that there is something untranslatable in, for example, 
uh, Parmenides or Heraclitus or Anaximander. There is something untranslatable there. But don't worry, I've got the German language and the German language is so pure and so philosophical, it will be able to take in this untranslatable and in fact, translate it, right? So it's actually, and this is something I think that's not uh, pointed out enough, it's actually not the untranslatable. It's rather the idea that there is a certain truth that is available to certain languages. So it's untranslatable as a truth accessible only to some. Now we know where that leads to, and it's it's akin to what Ricoeur called the, the search for a sort of prelapsarian language. And this is clearly politically and ethically dubious. Okay, so let's get to the last part of the paper, which looks at Barbara Kassan and the idea of the untranslatable as what we keep on not translating. So uh, Kassan's uh, Dictionary of Untranslatables, which as we know has now been translated into so many different uh, languages and really has set in motion various uh, linguistic projects of uh, what Ricoeur would call linguistic hospitality between multiple communities, that it, it, almost, uh, it almost proves uh, Kassan's point. So for Kassan, as we know, the untranslatable is something that draws us to a text. We, we translate it, but then we have to go back and translate again. One of the ways Kassan understands this is is that the untranslatable is what complicates the universal and it sets conceptual invention in motion. There is here in Kassan's work a celebration of ambiguity or multiple meanings as what gives rise to a moment of reflection and ultimately a moment of creation. Here we don't have a linguistic relativism, so Kassan is not arguing that every language carves up the world differently, as uh, Ricard said, leading to an idea of translators as schizophrenics. No, no, what Kassan is saying is, look, we all experience the same world, but we experience it in our particular and subjective ways. The universal world is expressed in particular languages, and those particularities are not nothing. Language operates, she says, as a net that captures the world in a particular way, with each net capturing different things, but ultimately it's still the same world. And we find here echoes of the work of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir in the idea that we are all um, universal subjects who experience our transcendence of universality through our particular ways of interpreting and living in the world. Now, the problem for uh, Kassan with the universal particular divide in the history of philosophy has been the reduction of everything to an abstract and imposed universality instead of beginning with the particular and working our way out to a shared universality. And here we find again those echoes of a phenomenological method of beginning from lived experience and working towards a shared objectivity. All of this I want to hold on to from Kassan, but I want to add a sort of non-synchronous synchronous temporality that we get from Derrida and Levinas. And that's what I want to turn to for my last slide. I want to hang on to a lot of what Kassan gives us, this idea of the untranslatable as what we keep on not translating, the untranslatable as that which complicates the universal by revealing the manner in which any universal is only experienced from the point of view of the particular. But what I want to add is this idea of a double temporality, and this comes in some sense from the work of Emmanuel Levinas, who describes the subject as being in two times and thus a transcendence. So for Levinas, we all live in one way in a sort of chronological temporality. One thing happens after the other. Traditional accounts of, of lived experience have followed that Aristotelian and ultimately Husserlian notion of time as continuing on one thing after another. But there is also a second, what Levinas describes as a diachronic temporality and this is the experience of time that escapes us. We uh, notice it in the experience of aging. We notice it 
in the um, lack of our capacity to reproduce things like pain or nausea. Those things exist and then they are gone, right? There is a lapse or a loss of time. That diachronic temporality operates simultaneously with the synchronic or chronological time. There is an echo in Derrida's claim that nothing is untranslatable and everything is untranslatable here. Derrida often talks about wanting to understand things um, at the same time, being things, words meaning two things at the same time, experiences being two things at the same time, just like the Levinasian subject is in two times, right? We have the capacity to encounter things in different ways simultaneously. We are not restricted to a chronological uh, notion of temporality or indeed of signification. So for Derrida, the untranslatable, is, the untranslatable is that which exceeds our capacity to grasp or know totally. It is what resists our claim to universal knowledge. In a text, the untranslatable is what causes translation. And if there is nothing, if we didn't need to translate, if there was no untranslatable there, then the text would just disappear. We would understand totally. There wouldn't be no need for translation. Um, but it's also the thing, in a, in a more practical sense, when we are translating, it is the thing that is undecidable. Right? So Derrida, throughout his work, deals with these undecidable words, pharmacon, babel, the Blanchot neologism of arrête, relevance. All these words are undecidable because they can mean two things at once. Right? And Derrida says, you know, every time we translate one of these words, we come down on the side of one or the other, but the double meaning or the undecidability remains in the source text. Now, what I want to say is that this is what happens with another person. The untranslatable in the other is what triggers our metaphysical desire in Levinasian terms. It is the thing in the other person that we can't fully know. It is the thing in the other person that we respond to when we respond ethically, when we see the other person really as another person. It is what is in the other person that is not available to us to own or possess or to use the other as an other person. There's the end untranslatable as that which exceeds us, offers us a model for ethical intersubjective relations by demonstrating those moments of pause where we realize that each person is somebody who exceeds our capacity to know them. Thank you very much for your time.